All right, in this video, we're going to look at double integrals uh, for a over a region uh, using polar coordinates. And uh, the problem here is that we've got, we're asked to find the volume under the paraboloid z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And above the disk, x minus 1 quantity squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1 in the xy plane. Um, now, we don't explicitly see the polar coordinates there, um, but uh, the disk that we're going to be integrating uh, over is, uh, is, is has a border that's a circle, and so that's going to be best modeled with polar coordinates. In fact, we're not actually given any integrals here, but um, the double integral of a surface, right, finds volume. So it's really asking to find the double integral of this paraboloid uh, over this disk. Um, so uh, the paraboloid also kind of suggests that it might be easier to use polar coordinates, but but mainly it's the, the region you're integrating over. If that's uh, easier to work with in polar coordinates, um, then uh, that's when you would want to convert. So um, let's go ahead and convert our equations to polar coordinates. And uh, we've got our equations for converting between rectangular and polar on the left. Um, and so we'd be looking for uh, x plus y, x squared, x squared plus y squared to replace it with r squared. And uh, and then looking for replacing x and y with r cosine theta and r sine theta. Uh, let's start with the disk itself and just looking at the boundary because that's what we'll use for integration. The boundary is when x minus 1 squared plus y squared is equal to 1. Uh, and so you might think to replace x with r cosine theta and y with r sine theta, but we're so close to having x squared and y squared here um, that that would tell us to, to try for that. Um, and so we'd want to expand the x minus 1 squared, multiplying that out. We get x squared minus 2x plus 1. And then we can add 2x to both sides and subtract 1 from both sides. And, you know, the 1s subtract away. And the 2x is now over here. And now we have that x squared plus y squared. Um, so we're able to replace that with r squared. And then the 2x here uh, will replace x with r cosine theta. Now, we ideally would have r as a function of theta. Uh, and so in order to solve for r, we're going to want to get everything on one side. So subtract the 2r cosine theta. And now that that's equal to 0, we can, we can factor that. And the common factor is r. And so we have r equals 0 and r minus 2 cosine theta equals 0. Uh, and so r equals 0 and r equals 2 cosine theta. So those will end up being used uh, for the boundaries of the domain of integration. Uh, in fact, we can kind of look at the picture here and see that um, the boundary closest to the origin denoted by r equals h1 of theta, right, that's going to be the zero. And then the boundary further away from the origin, uh, h2 of theta, will be the two cosine theta. Right, so that's helpful for the 
domain of integration, but if we are switching to polar coordinates, then we need the integrand, which is the function of two variables, the surface that we're integrating under, um, to also be in those coordinates, right? So f needs to be a function of r and theta. And so we will convert that equation next. Um, fortunately, z is still the same z in polar coordinates. So it's just a matter of swapping out x and y for r and theta. And the x squared plus y squared is even more apparent here, just factoring the negative. And we quickly get to f as a function of r and theta. It's 4 minus r squared. So that is enough information to go ahead and set up the double integral. Um, but I have us graphing the domain of integration. In fact, you might want to just kind of graph uh, the whole problem. Um, to kind of get an idea of what's going on uh, with this three-dimensional region, we're trying to find the volume. So let's look at a couple graphs, um, and we'll start with the 3D and then look at a 2D graph of the domain of integration. So for 3D, I use GeoGebra and... I don't think GeoGebra can handle the polar coordinates. So we'll use the rectangular coordinates we were given. That's the paraboloid. We're trying to find the volume under that. And then we want it just over this disk, x minus 1 squared plus y squared less than or equal to one. Let's get rid of the plane there. So, This uh, disk, right, is just a circle in the xy plane, uh, including the interior. And we're essentially trying to kind of take a, a cut of this thing. And that's the thing we're trying to find the volume of there. So we'll be integrating that surface over that disk. And I mean, if you switch this back to just an equation, then that might give you a better idea of it. Of course, there you kind of rotate it around and see what we're actually doing, kind of coring this thing out. And so again, it's just that volume there. Going over to a 2D graph, I uh, just use Desmos. And here we can use polar coordinates. And this is a good way to check um, that we did the conversion correctly. Right? So you can start with the rectangular. And you get a circle, radius one, centered at one, zero. Uh, and then for polar, Just start typing in theta and it should recognize that. And you can see the r equals 2 cosine theta forms the boundary of that, right? And we really just need the boundary 
uh, for when we integrate, it will automatically fill in that circle. So that agreement there kind of validates step one. So we can grab that picture and put it in here. We saw last time that it's nice to have the set theory notation for the region um, here. So this is our region D. And so it's a set of all order pairs R theta. Um, and you remember from step one, we had R equals zero, R equals two, cosine theta, um, and those were kind of going to tell us what h1 and h2 of theta were, there was actually nothing in terms of what theta was. So if, if you have one of these variables that's not restricted by any equations, um, it's sort of known as a free variable, um, then it should be able to take on any of the normal values. Sometimes that's just you know negative infinity to infinity, um, but with an angle like theta, we usually just go from zero to two pi uh, to trace something out. Now we can sometimes with these polar functions, zero to two pi doesn't trace the whole thing out. Um, so what you could do here is put in uh, zero to two pi and make sure it does indeed draw the whole circle. In fact, we actually just need uh, zero to pi to draw that circle. So you kind of want to find what is the interval that will just draw the shape once because these are periodic functions, right? And so even though cosine is two pi periodic, um, this polar function is pi periodic. Um, now, you know, how do I know I can't go smaller? Well, try, you know, cutting it down to pi over two and kind of mess around with this um, three pi over four. And so you see pi over two is half the, the circle, three pi over four is three quarters. Um, and so then you get four pi over four is the full thing. And you could toy around a little bit with zero as well. Like what if that was pi over four? Okay. Um, what if it was negative pi over four? So a little bit of troubleshooting to kind of determine um, the minimum interval to just draw this shape once. Uh, in fact, I wonder if we can do put in a variable here. I mean, if we could put in a, a slider there and kind of make it draw the animation. So, um, that will give us the our values for alpha and beta here, right? That theta goes between zero and pi. Uh, and then we have, yeah, we found in part one, our H1 and H2. So R goes between zero Right, that's H1, H2. So now we've got the domain of integration all figured out. We're ready to move on and set up the iterated double integral. And you can see that the way we're doing these, they're just type one integrals where we always are integrating R first and then theta. Um, I mean, technically you could have the boundaries be theta as a function of R, um, but we don't do that in this course. So uh, we'll start with the inner integral. Remember our function 
f of r theta, we found that in terms of r and theta in step one. So that goes here. But don't forget, there's like a built-in r that's there with the dr d theta. The r actually goes with the d theta to give it uh, units. And so that r always gets multiplied on to whatever your function is. And then we use h1 and h2 for the limits of integration there. So 0 to 2 to some theta. All right, after we do the r integration, we're going to do a theta integration, and theta goes from 0 to pi. So that's our iterated double integral. And we now, in step four, evaluate the inner integral, uh, integrating with respect to r, treating theta as a constant. And what I'd want to do is distribute that r there. So the integral from 0 to 2 cosine theta of 4r minus r cubed dr. Now, using the power rule, antiderivative of 4r is 2r squared, and the antiderivative of r cubed is 1 fourth r to the fourth. At that point, we can replace r with the limits of integration. So evaluate the upper limit minus evaluating at the lower limit. So 2r squared, we have 2 times 2 cosine theta squared. And then r to the fourth is 2 cosine theta to the fourth. Um, and then we'd have zero, right? Two times zero squared minus one quarter zero fourth. So when r is zero, we just get zero terms. And so it's just that first two terms, um, which we could simplify by squaring. So uh, two cosine squared is four cosine squared. And, uh, and then we have a two there, so we get 8 cosine squared. Uh, raising that 2 to the fourth power, you get 16, but then there's a 1 fourth there, so minus 4 cosine to the fourth. So there's the simplified version of that, and we're ready now for the outer integral. So integrate from 0 to pi, uh, 8 cosine squared theta minus 4 cosine to the fourth theta with respect to theta. All right, so these kind of integrals are covered in Calc 2, um, but perhaps you don't remember those techniques. Um, I always have to kind of rederive some of these formulas. Um, Hopefully everybody remembers that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. And that means that sine squared equals one minus cosine squared. Right. Um, and then you want the double angle. Cosine of two theta is cosine squared minus sine squared. And then you can actually put this in here for sine squared. The cosine of 2 theta uh, is actually 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. And then solving that for cosine squared theta, uh, you would add 1 to both sides. And then divide both sides by 2. Um, 
but we don't need to divide by two uh, because we don't actually have cosine squared theta. We have eight cosine squared theta. So um, I mean, you might be familiar with the reduction formula. right there, um, but rather than introduce that fraction, um, we will multiply uh, by four. So multiplying by four, uh, we get four cosine two theta plus four equals eight cosine squared theta. Um, and so that'll allow us to do that first integral. All right. So let's do that here. Integral from zero to pi, eight cosine squared theta d theta. Using this relationship, um, that should be equivalent to the integral of four cosine two theta plus four. Uh, the antiderivative of cosine of two theta is sine of two theta um, divided by two, right? And so this goes to a two sine two theta uh, and an antiderivative of four with respect to theta is four theta. At that point, we just evaluate at zero and pi and get two sine of two pi plus four pi minus two sine of two times zero plus four times zero. Uh, sine of zero is zero, four times zero is zero. So this whole thing is zero. Sine of two pi is also zero. So all that's left here is just the four pi. Uh, now let's do the other integral there. So we've got minus the integral from zero to pi of four cosine to the fourth theta d theta. Now uh, we need to use a similar kind of power reduction to get to that. Um, and now that we're done with this one, we should just go here and square both sides of this formula. All right, and that'll give you a four cosine to the four theta. Um, if you square the left side, I guess I should have given myself more room there. Let's do the left side first. Cosine cube there. Cosine squared two theta plus two cosine two theta plus one. Mm. And of course, if there's a negative, uh, then we just have a negative in front of the whole thing. So we can just remember that the negative is here. I mean, that's a little, little dangerous. So maybe um, you distribute the negative to each term, um, but let's try not to forget that that's there. Uh, whatever we get from this integral, we'll subtract it from four pi. But all right, so using that formula we've got, uh, this integral is the integral from zero to pi of cosine squared two theta plus two cosine two theta plus one theta. That's equivalent to that four cosine to the four theta. Uh, 
uh, so we can easily integrate the last two terms, but that cosine squared two theta uh, is still a little problematic. And I guess now we need uh, that one formula I kind of erased earlier, um, where we did take this before it was squared. And just divide by two, right? The one half cosine of two theta plus one half equals cosine squared theta. Uh, but that's not actually what we have, right? We have cosine squared two theta. Um, well, that's not a problem. We can replace. Uh, each theta by twice its amount, so cosine squared of two theta, one half doesn't change. And then here, we already have a two theta, so it would get doubled to four theta. All right. So now we have the integral from zero to pi of one half cosine four theta plus one half. That's from the first term plus two cosine two theta plus one theta. Now the one half and the one, let's combine those and just get a three halves. And then we will find the antiderivative of this. So antiderivative of uh, one half cosine four theta, it's going to be sine theta, one half sine four theta over four, and so that turns into a one eighth sine four theta. The three halves will be a three over two theta, and then the two cosine two theta is going to be two sine two theta divided by two, so twos cancel and we get just sine two theta. And then that's evaluated from zero to pi. All right, so at pi, we've got one eighth sine of four pi plus three pi over two plus sine of two pi. And at zero, one eighth sine of four times zero plus three halves times zero plus sine of two times zero. Again, all these ones evaluated at theta equals zero are zero. And in fact, some of these are as well. Sine of two pi is zero, sine of four pi is zero. So all that's left there is three pi over two. All right. So at the end of the day, we still want to subtract. Um, and so it is 4 pi from the integral for F8 cosine squared theta minus 3 pi over 2 for the minus 4 cosine to the fourth theta. Um, and that's 8 pi over 2 minus 3 pi over 2, which is 5 pi over 2. So five pi over two is ostensibly the volume under the paraboloid over that disk. Um, let's go on to validating that. And so we can validate using differentiation to check the integrations, using technology to compute the integrals, estimating the volume from the graph uh, or area times average value. Um, or using a different coordinate system. So you could try to go back and do the integral uh, in rectangular coordinates. All right, let's take a look at these. Let's start with differentiating to check the integrations. So we did a lot of integrations here, um, but uh, if we kind of hone in on just where we found the antiderivatives, the first things happen. First thing happens right up here. 
And so we could check this uh, by taking an R derivative of two R squared minus one fourth R to the fourth with respect to R. The derivative of two R squared is four R and then the derivative of one fourth R to the fourth is R cubed. Matches up, so that checks out. Um, all right, the other antiderivatives occurred here and here. So these are theta integrations, and so we check with a theta derivative. Derivative with respect to theta of 2 sine 2 theta plus 4 theta. Derivative of sine 2 theta uh, would be cosine 2 theta times 2, and so we get 4 cosine 2 theta. And the derivative of 4 theta would just be 4, so that checks out. And then here, another theta derivative. Uh, one eighth sine four theta plus three over two theta plus sine two theta. And uh, the derivative of sine four theta would be cosine four theta, uh, the, the chain rule we get four, four over eight would give us one half. Derivative of three halves theta would be three halves. And the derivative of sine two theta would be cosine two theta times two. All right, so that's checked off as well. So it looks like we did antiderivatives correctly there. Uh, Next up, uh, it says use technology to compute the integrals. Uh, she didn't have the Python stuff set up here. That should be pretty quick. So we've got some Python code for double integrals and polar coordinates, and so we'll just grab Oh, that actually, this is the same problem. So let's run our boilerplate code. This is the example we just did. Uh, the difference is just declaring R and theta as their own variables. So using SymPy, we declare R and theta as variables. And then defining your function using R and theta. So our function was 4 minus R squared. And then here we do the double integration. So the inner integral here, uh, and now what I did was I multiplied by r here. Um, alternatively, could do that outside. Just make sure you don't forget. You still need to multiply the integrand or the integrating function by r. And we integrated r from zero to two cosine theta using sim dot cos for cosine, and then we integrated theta from zero to pi. We very quickly get five pi over two. All right, uh, using a different coordinate system. So we're given this in rectangular coordinates. Um, it's possible to convert to spherical. We'll look at using spherical coordinates later on. Um, but just trying to set this up in rectangular coordinates, um, the function that we'd be integrating is all set up for that, right? Um, and then maybe viewing this as like a, a type one integral, right? You know, this is our boundary. And if you solve for y, you see that you'd need two functions, right? 
So the top is the positive root, one minus x minus one quantity squared. And then the bottom is the opposite root. And so those would be your limits of integration. Uh, and then that would be your integrating y. And then you'd integrate x from 0 to 2. So can that be done? Let's see. Um, so thinking of y as the variable of integration, uh, the antiderivative is not hard, right? Um, it would be, we just do the inner integral, we'd get 4y minus x squared y minus one third y cubed. And then you have your limits. And then we have to replace the y's with, with those. So that's where it sort of turns into a bit of a, a monstrosity here. Putting in the positive, we get four square root one minus x minus one squared. Um, I mean, we could factor the y there, maybe make it a little easier. Just to write, it's not gonna be any easier to integrate. And then the cube of the square root is going to be 3 halves power. And then we would subtract doing this at the opposite root. And uh, you know, cubing that negative, it'll still be negative. So this would come out positive. So you get a little bit of a break here where that term and that term are the same sign. So they would combine. Uh, and then this one and this one are also the same sign. And so they would combine as well. So you'd get two times each of these, I think. And then you're integrating that from 0 to 2 with respect to x. Um, so I don't think that second term is too bad. You could do that one, but that first term uh, with the x squared inside the square root and the four minus x squared multiplied out there, um, it's gonna be very challenging. So it's possible that you could work through that by hand, but that is probably where I would stop and say that's, not going to be that helpful as a validation, but sometimes this one's just a little more work and uh, it is a good way to validate and see, but that should give us the same result. Um, so feel free to carry that one to the end if you have some of the patience for that. And uh, lastly, we look at the geometric uh, value. So this works when you're going to interpret the double integral as the volume. Um, and so let's go back to the graph here. And you want to kind of use any known geometric shapes if possible. Um, and so this one has an obvious 
shape, which is a cylinder. Um, and it kind of looks like we took a cylinder and kind of sliced it in half there. So I'll uh, use one half to kind of account for the fact that it's just half of that, but then think of this as a full cylinder. Um, volume of cylinder is pi r squared h. The radius is just the radius of that disk, um, which is one. And then the height, it looks like it goes up to four from the xy plane, so we put a four in there. So that gives me two pi. Um, so that's a pretty rough estimate for pi of pi over two. Um, it's overestimating because of the way we kind of cut it in half, but it's it's in the ballpark, right? Um, sometimes it's not gonna match up with a geometric shape. And so you can think of the area of the base with just an average value of the function. So for that, I'd still wanna think of the base So volume would be base times, or yeah, base times height. And for the base, we'd use the area of the base, which is um, pi r squared for the disk. Uh, and for the height, we'd use some average value of the function. So for the pi r squared, again, r is one. And so that just gives us pi. For an average value of the function, we kind of pick some value in the middle there, right? based on how this looks. Um, and so and our function is four minus x squared minus y squared. Um, so maybe just picking x to be one and y to be zero, which is four minus one squared minus zero squared or three. So that gives me three pi. That's an even worse estimate, isn't it? So now you have limited success with that uh, approximating. These are rough estimates, but again, they're the same sign and and they're in the same order of magnitude. So um, nothing, no red flags in terms of mistakes made here. But if any of these validations look off, right, we're going to go in and try to find those mistakes and correct them. All right, that covers double integrals and polar coordinates, and I'll do it for this video.